And uh, I'm going to, uh, Johnson, I know you haven't, uh, I'm going to let Johnson, we're going to do a little tag team on this. I'm going to, uh, to get it started, uh, is, is Mike Beeson on there? Do I see him? I don't see his face on there yet. Oh, there he is right there, right square in the middle. You would have been the ex of the uh, bingo. Um, so, hey, real quick, uh, I'm going to give you tw – actually, you know what? Now I'm going to give you 25 seconds – or 20 seconds to piece. Beeson and Johnson, introduce Larry and tell your favorite Larry Taylor story in 20 seconds or less. Oh, gosh. Larry does not want to hear my – I mean, it, it's like – that's like a private matter. Uh, all jokes aside um, – one of my dearest brothers in the whole wide world. I literally met uh, Larry uh, literally a year before I began following, following Jesus. And uh, in my earliest years, uh, I would look up to two or three guys uh, in those days when I was just trying to figure out who to how to walk. And one of them was Larry Taylor. So dear brother in Christ right there. Awesome. Hey, Johnson, you got, got something for us? Well, I, I love Larry too much to uh, tell any stories on him, but boy, we've got some. So he, he's practically perfect, but I've seen some fun sides to him. But uh, on the serious side, and I, most of y'all on the screen know, but Larry is truly one of the godliest leaders on our planet. He is the premier uh, leader in Christian education and kingdom uh, education around the planet. He, he led at PCA for so many years, and now he's the president of ACSI, which oversees Christian schools globally. So it's a treat to have you, Larry. Thanks for uh, taking the time, and it's an honor to call you friend. Happy 35th anniversary to you and Delinda. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, and hey, just real quick, so um, uh, Billy Popoff, Hey, would you sign on just a second? Would you mind? I know we've got a bunch. I know Mr. Embry. We got Billy. Uh, we got a we got a missionary, Grayson Warren, on with as well as a fellow alumni as well. Billy, would you mind opening us up in prayer? And we're going to let Larry get it kicked off. Yep, of course. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this time that we can just gather together and um, with other men who are willing and uh, wanting to pursue the Lord through this study. And so I thank you for Dr. Taylor and his willingness. Like. I pray that you just give him wisdom to continue to communicate um, what you're wanting to speak to us through your word tonight. God, and then just be with these men as we go out in um, our work and our daily lives and our families. And pray that we glorify you more um, with the way that we live. We love you. Amen. 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 Dr. Taylor, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Dan. And I mean, I'll tell you what, uh, my heart is, is warmed up big time. Uh, seeing a lot of uh, friends I haven't talked to in a while, and, uh, uh, and especially these, I, I, I love you all, but I, I, I'm a little biased towards these PCA alum. Um, and I, I think what you should do is let me tell stories about them. All right. <laughs> hey, listen, I think there's at least five years removed, so it's safe now. You know, they can't take diplomas back. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and it's also what a pleasure it is to see uh, Mark, Mark Taylor from India. How you doing, Mark? Doing an incredible job, uh, amazing job um, for the Lord in, in India, really around the world, and Pastor El May and, and all of you. Um, well, really, I, I am truly honored uh, to uh, join you tonight and or – I don't know if it's tonight in other parts of the world, but tonight it's, it's, it's in Dallas, it's tonight. Um, but, you know, it's been, uh, obviously, it's kind of an understatement to say it's been um, a crazy, a crazy few months, uh, surreal uh, times. Um, I don't know, I hope it never happens again, but um, I just I don't think any of us have ever experienced the, uh, literally the whole world uh, being shut down in, in so many respects. And of course, we're praying for, um, uh, you know, for uh, the people that are in infected uh, by the virus and also uh, not just the virus itself, but uh, just everything that ripples through um, our communities and, and, uh, and so on. But 
Uh, and then on the tail end of that, uh, in the midst of that, the uh, racial uh, unrest and uh, just the continued um, uh, combustion, uh, so to speak, on on that issue. And so it's, uh, and even a few other things, but uh, I just want to start off with saying this, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's pretty profound. Um, so you better get your note taking. This is like really profound here. God is in control. Uh, and I've had to embrace uh, that. Uh, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Um, uh, we draw a lot of strength that God's in control. Isaiah 41, 10 says, So, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous uh, right hand. And these are certainly uh, surreal days. Um, I can't I can't remember who said it. I don't know if I was listening to a podcast, but or reading an article. But someone uh, made a comment, and I, and I wrote it down. They said uh, it's it's someone called it. It's like a shadow over the world right now. Um, everything that we're experiencing, a shadow over the world. And, and it reminded me, some of you like uh, um, C.S. Lewis, some of you like Tolkien and, and, uh, and, and what they've written and, and, and how, uh, how, how magical uh, their, uh, their writing has penetrated even the, the non-Christian community. But Tol I remember Tolkien said this, uh, J.R. Tolkien said, above all shadows rides the sun. And so here's this one quote that says, it's like a shadow over the world, but here's Tolkien that comes back and says, above all sh shadows rides the sun. And, and, and he meant the S-U-N, but if, if you change one letter in that, that sun, S-U-N, and, and you, you exchange the U, uh, put an O in for the, the U and capitalize the S, and it, it's, it's even more profound. Above all shadows rides the sun, Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis said, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Uh, there's a lot that we can't change right now, but there's certainly... I know in my life, whether it's my family um, or the call that God has on my life or your life, uh, there's a lot often that we, we say, I wish I'd have done that. I wish, done that. Uh, I wish I could handle this differently. But I love how Lewis says, you, you can't necessarily change how everything began. But we can certainly um, change, start where you are and change the beginning. And tonight... If I had to pick a, um, a, a passage out of God's word that would be the thread of what I really want to talk about tonight, it's in Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse 16. Um, I'm reminded of Matthew 10:16 when, when Jesus was sending out his 12. And he said to them, and I'm just going to, um, read from the NIV here. He said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And, you know, when you read, when you, when you really kind of dissect that, um, uh, I, I, I think I missed, uh, for, for many years, I think I missed the power of that commissioning because I, 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 I not, had not taken the time to understand the context of that commissioning. And when you understand the context of that commissioning, that statement goes to a whole new level. Jesus was training his disciples how to behave. He knew that his disciples were any, entering a world that was hostile uh, to believers. He didn't want the disciples to behave like wolves. 
He expected them, them to be Christ-like in a godless culture by combining, and this is the key word, combining the wisdom of the serpent with the wholesomeness of the dove. And we need to, you know, we need to lean into this biblical principle which is really foundational to kingdom work. And I think especially kingdom work today. And, and I know we have people from um, all over the globe, but um, I know in the United States right now, it, this, this, this application of, of a, and this is not a cynical statement, it's, it's, just, the, it's just the outright truth, a, a rapid drift of a post-Jesus um, culture. And so in many ways, the commissioning Jesus is given to these 12s. It really speaks to our time right now that uh, it's foundational to kingdom work. Jesus wanted his disciples to find that optimal balance between the dove and the serpent. Gentle without being a softy and sacrificial without being taken advantage of, aware of the unprincipled schemes used by the opposition, but still taking the high road. Um, I, I think probably what prompted uh, that was how often Peter um, didn't do that, right? I mean, he was probably preaching right to Peter, you know, Peter, um, don't cut anybody's ears off, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't do this, don't do that. But as we, as we continue to enter and prepare um, ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, um, the people that we influence, uh, this Matthew 10, 16 principle, that balance is so key. Um, I think we all expect trials. We've heard, uh, I don't know everybody on the screen, but, but I know most of you, and uh, I know we've all heard uh, probably hundreds of times that, uh, that we're, we're to expect trials, um, but, uh, but our perspective, that's the main thing I want to talk about tonight, our perspective, not only that God's in control, but how we behave properly in a godless culture, wisdom slash wholesomeness, our mindset, uh, God is speaking into this as part of the discipleship process of understanding the times and understanding um, how to uh, how to be. Uh, I call it an Acts chapter seventeen uh, disciple. Uh, when when you know that that great moment, I think it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible of the, this this optimal balance when Paul left the synagogue in Acts chapter seventeen. And he was immediately confronted by um, uh, two different worldviews. Uh, he was confronted by the Epicureans and the Stoics. And for Paul to find balance, this was huge because, you know, um, Paul had a tendency just to go off and, and, and just start preaching, which sometimes you have to. But Paul found a balance because he knew he was in the Athenian culture. Athens. He knew that Athens had um, a pluralistic society. It was uh, many gods. Uh, Paul was not with the Jews, who had a foundation in at least uh, uh, a deity, uh, a god. Paul understood that he was with a bunch of people who believed in everything. And how he embraced the moment, <clears throat> I think I call it scholastic discipleship. And I'm not talking about SAT or ACT discipleship. I'm talking about just understanding the times, uh, like the uh, the tribes of Issachar understood the times. And um, and so I, I want to challenge us tonight. Uh, really, I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to protect, uh, and this is, this is one thing God has been encouraging me on, is to protect your mind, to protect your attitude, 
that your your perspective and my perspective truly uh, truly matters as we continue through. Not, I'm not just talking about COVID-19, but as we continue to move through this culture, I'm reminded of a, a story um, in uh, 1675. Um, 1675. That was a long time ago. In uh, Bedford, uh, England, uh, the famous uh, Puritan preacher uh, John Bunyan was was arrested. He had been preaching uh, without a without a license. Okay, he had uh, been preaching uh, uh, without a license, and he was jailed for six months. Uh, previously. Um, if you know anything about John Bunyan, he had ar already served 12 years in prison uh, for uh, similar things. And during that time, he had written uh, a bunch of pamphlets and books and stuff like that that, uh, that, are, that are available today. But what caught my attention um, as, I, as I studied Bunyan's life was that he didn't see this imprisonment as... A tragedy. He took it as an optimistic view. Um, he's he's reported of saying this, and I quote: "I have been away from my writing too long. Maybe this is not so much a prison as an office from which I can reach the world with Christ's message." It was during these months that he wrote the Pilgrim's Progress probably one of the greatest, uh, in, in an allegory of, of the Christian life, one of the greatest books ever written in the English language. And I thought, man, if Larry Taylor could always have that type of perspective, that type of, uh, that type of uh, attitude, um, I don't know if we're allowed to open the floor can, Dan, can I ask a question and just kind of open the floor a little bit here? Because um, I, I wanted to ask a question. Forget about John Bunyan for a second. But does that story um, remind you of anybody in God's word that did not let their circumstances dictate their actions? Can you, can you think of any biblical characters that just that just come to mind right now where they, they're in imprisonment, and sometimes literally, sometimes not literally. Uh, it didn't stop them from uh, pursuing Christ and spreading God's word. Anybody? Anybody come to mind? Jadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. John Perry <laughs> says Job. Mm. Amen. Paul. 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 Daniel, Daniel from Will Harker. Joseph. Well, jo Joseph had, uh, it was like one thing after another one. That <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, those are, those are good. Those are great examples. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, if, if we had time, we, we, we could unpack uh, those situations a little bit more. Most of you who know me know that I, uh, when I go to heaven, after I hug Mama Hager, I'm going to get in that long line uh, for the Apostle Paul, and I just, uh, I just marvel. Um, I marvel at how Paul was so uh, consistent and diligent in his surreal times. Um, I mean, when I think about the letters that were written, especially uh, to the Philippians, while in a stinking, cold, wet dungeon cell, um, <laughs> his attitude, and, 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 and I hope tonight doesn't come across as a self-help talk, it's not. It's, it's a, his attitude, his perspective, was, yeah, I'm in prison, but man, I, I've been able to share the gospel with hundreds of some of the most influential people uh, in, in the world. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Wow. And so 
I, I have a I have a question for you tonight. <clears throat> and this is something to maybe maybe ponder. Um, it's it's basically my challenge. You know, you find out a lot. You find out a lot about people during a crisis, don't you? Uh, you find out a lot about. I mean, we are we are observing mayors, governors, presidents, uh, media. Uh, I'm observing right now the ACSI Association of Christian Schools International. I'm I'm observing closely our crisis management. You, you the management team. You learn so much about people and how they're responding. But my, my question, if, if that is accurate, if, if we are observing, and I know we are because I've talked to many of you, and we, we talk about how so-and-so is handling this and so-and-so is handling that. But, but if that's accurate, that we are observing, then this, this also has to be true. Uh, we have to assume that people are watching us. If we're watching them, and we're having all these talks. I mean, I just, you know, left a, watching a, a, you know, the press conference that probably some of you guys were watching, you know, the latest and greatest press conference um, about uh, the COVID-19 and everything. So my question is, how are we responding uh, as individuals, but mostly as Christians? And we know this matters. We know this matters because historians record how people respond. Uh, in fact, uh, to kind of bring it closer to home, I just want to highlight two, two examples historically of how Christians responded uh, to epidemics, to pandemics. Uh, when, when, the, <clears throat> when the plague hit Wittenberg, Wittenberg, Germany, um, uh, and and the, the bubonic plague hit Wittenberg, Germany in 1527. The death rate, we think it's bad with COVID-19. The death rate of the bubonic plague has been calculated as 30 to 60% of the population. 30 to 60% of the population. Uh, Wittenberg University was closed. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> the closing of colleges, the closing of schools. Um, <clears throat> but Wittenberg happened to be where, where Martin Luther was from. And Martin Luther and his wife, his beautiful, sweet wife, uh, Katharina, they, they decided to stay right there in Wittenberg during that, that time. And, and she was pregnant at the time. They, they, everybody urged Martin Luther to flee, but they chose to stay in order to minister to the sick and the dying. So a bunch of a bunch of uh, spiritual leaders from other cities actually wrote Luther and said, uh, "Can can you can you give us advice? I mean, I, you know, we we don't know if this is biblical what you're doing or not biblical what you're doing." And Luther wrote a pamphlet, and I would encourage you to, to Google this, and it's not a long read, but it's a pamphlet that amazingly <clears throat> speaks in, it, it's relevant even today. The, the name of the pamphlet, this, is a, this was Luther's response to uh, his brothers and sisters that were saying, what should we do? Should we leave our city? Should we stay here and serve the sick and the dying? The pamphlet is called, whether one may flee from a deadly plague. And it combines realism and faith in a way that I think is even powerful today as we deal with our crisis. And I love, um, um, I, I love a couple of quotes in it. Luther doesn't answer, <clears throat> what would Jesus do? Rather, he addresses, and, and this, this is part of his, his, his pamphlet, he addresses this question. What would you do if it was Jesus? And in a key quote, directly relevant, I think, to our coronavirus, Luther says this. Listen to this quote from Luther. He says, 
This I well know, that if it were Christ or his mother who were laid low by illness, everybody would be so solicitous and would gladly become a servant or a helper. Everyone would want to be bold and fearless. Nobody would flee, but everyone would come running. If you wish to serve Christ and to wait on him very well, you have your sick neighbor close at hand. Go to him and serve him, and you will surely find Christ in him. That was, that was Luther's response. I think it's also important um, just to say as a side note, um, part of his pamphlet was also, uh, Luther wasn't reckless. He counseled his readers um, to use, uh, we hear this a lot, um, I don't think they used the, this phrase back in Luther's day, but he counseled his readers to utilize medicine and intelligence uh, data. There's even a quote from this pamphlet. Uh, Luther says, I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. And he, Luther also practiced what we call social distancing right now. He says, and I quote, I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus infect and pollute others and so cause their death. Uh, he defended quarantines. Um, so my point is, it wasn't this reckless whatever. I mean, it was, it was balanced. And, 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 and he did not judge those who left the city. That was up to them uh, and the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> but long before Luther, um, long before Luther, the early church was no stranger to uh, epidemics and plagues and mass hysteria. In fact, according to both Christians and non-Christians, uh, historians, one of the main catalysts for the church's explosive growth in its, in its early years was how Christians navigated disease, suffering, and death. So what did Christians do differently that, that shook uh, the empire? And this, this is just one example. Um, it, you history buffs would... Uh, probably already know this or would want to dive into it, but it was during, um, it was between A.D. 249 and A.D. 262 uh, um, pandemic. Uh, the historians say there were about 5,000 people a day that died just in Rome uh, during this time. And uh, one, one historian wrote this, and I thought this was a, a pretty interesting quote. The plague served as a schooling and testing for Christians. He wrote this. Most of our brother Christians showed unabounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, both believers and unbelievers. And it was during this time, um, and what I like about this historical account is even the non-Christian historian said, it was during this time that Christians made a name for themselves. They made a name for themselves, and it wasn't for self-glory, it wasn't to be on the top 10 of ESPN. It wasn't, be, you know, whatever. They made a name for themselves. The impact of their service stunned the empire. The impact of their service was twofold. Christian sacrifice for their fellow believers stunned the unbelieving world as they witnessed John 13.35. They witnessed John 13, 35. They didn't, they didn't hear the Christians quoting John 13, 35. They saw the love of their neighbor. They witnessed communal love like they had never seen it before. And it was during this time that the church exploded. 
I mean, it just absolutely exploded because a lot of the Christians that were uh, being served and, and, uh, and, and so forth that survived, uh, their strength was, uh, their faith was, strength, was strengthened. But it was the non-Christians. The non-Christians could not believe how the Christians were acting. It's completely, it blew them away. It reminds me of what's happening in Cuba right now um, and many other parts of the world. I mean, I've been to Cuba uh, 20, 25 times. And, you know, before Castro took over in Cuba, uh, there were hundreds of Christian schools, churches, seminaries. Castro takes over. He, he allows uh, uh, some of the seminaries to still exist, some of the churches to still, still exist. And if you know anything about <clears throat> the, uh, one of the ultimate goals of atheism is just to stamp out any belief in uh, God. Well, the... The church exploded in Cuba. The more oppression, the more explosion. And I believe it, it I mean, I, and I've read a couple books. I'm, I've read one that <clears throat> from uh, Dr. Israel Martin, who you guys remember Dr. Israel. He came over and uh, lived with us, lived with the Taylor crew for about seven months. And um, <clears throat> he did his uh, PhD dissertation on on, on the, the, the spread of faith uh, around Cuba. And, and um, he points out people that were like the Apostle Paul during the oppression. He points out people, I mean, real people who said, you know, the people that were getting thrown in jail, some of the pastors being shot uh, for having, but the gospel just exploded. And it didn't explode the way you would think it would explode. It exploded through house churches and different strategies. It, it didn't just explode by popping up another church on the corner. Um, it, it, uh, they, they stunned. I mean, the Cuban people that, I mean, when I go to Cuba, I like to hang out with the 70 to 80 year olds <clears throat> uh, who've lived it. And they tell me <clears throat> of the stories of when the oppression hit, how the church responded. It reminds me of A.D. 249 to 262, you find out <clears throat> a lot about people during a crisis, how Christians acted, stunned the unbelieving world. And I'll, and I'll close with, with this. Um, <clears throat> when, when, when somebody stuns the world, and it doesn't take a pandemic for us to stun the world. It could be as simple as uh, loving and serving somebody at the office. Um, whatever application um, you, you want to make, it doesn't take some big worldwide or even countrywide uh, issue. When, when we behave properly, and I go back to Matthew 10, that scripture I read earlier, when we behave properly, properly in the context of wherever we live, it creates curiosity. Uh, it, it, it stuns the world and, it, it, and it, it creates a curiosity. And I believe more than any um, that our actions, and hear me out, <clears throat> uh, th there's always going to be a time for just flat out preaching the gospel. Uh, you know, right? I'm not saying that's not important, but I believe in many ways we're going to see a percent of, if I could call it that, a percent of the opportunity to share the gospel preceded by building a bridge of curiosity. What is, what is different about that person? What's different about that group, that ministry, that church? Compassionate courage is still in vogue. And, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're a walking billboard. Uh, we're a walking billboard, a walking advertisement for Jesus. We advertise to the world the glory of God <clears throat> in two primary ways. First, telling people about the wonderful qualities of God and the great things he has done. We can never stop 
verbally telling people about Jesus Christ. But the second way we advertise to the world the glory of our God is to live in such a way that people will be able to see the excellence and the virtues of God in our lives. Our words, our actions, our thoughts, our works should brilliantly reflect the marvelous qualities of our Heavenly Father and be stamped with His excellence. Good works that come from our living union with Jesus Christ shine forth His excellence and display to the world the good, loving, kind, merciful, tender, faithful, and caring nature of God. So, my brothers, tonight, <clears throat> my encouragement is, regardless of how crazy the world is, let's stun the world by how we act, and may that create a curiosity that says, hey, I want to I want to listen to why you're so different. John 13, 35, they will know you by your love. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this group. Lord, I praise you for uh, your word. I praise you that for such a time as this, we, we are here on earth. We're experiencing uh, some surreal times but father we praise god that you're on your throne we praise god that you have recorded in your word uh, far greater uh, surreal times that we can lean into and learn uh, from paul from joseph from daniel father from your son jesus and then, Father, even historically, thank you that we are standing on the shoulders of men and women and children of faith, that because how they acted today, we still have the opportunity to proclaim your glory, your majesty, your mercy, and your grace. Father, may we be different. Help us to stun our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Dr. Taylor, I want to thank you for that. I, you know, as I was thinking about as you were going through there, guys, if, I know there's a, a number of you know Dr. Taylor somewhat well from either being a parent of a student or uh, maybe you got in trouble and you had to go to his office, uh, uh, you know, um, one of the things I, and I say that a little half-heartedly, you know, uh, one of my things, I always asked Dr. Taylor a long time ago, I said, you know, why do you always walk on the field, the football field, uh, or you walk on the sidelines by the games? And he always comes up, he says, I don't want you to hear what I'm thinking <laughs> about the game. And, but I will say that Dr. Taylor is one of those guys that uh, he, he's a giant, and the, the lesson that Dr. Taylor, you just preached just now or taught us just now, I think is uh, you, you've been a great uh, uh, minister and a good example for us. You've had to make some really tough decisions as a headmaster at Prestonwood. And uh, when it wasn't popular and when you look back, it was the right call always. Um, and you were a great leader and there's some, I'm thankful I'm, I'm being biased a little right now. I've got a son and daughter that got to, uh, learn under the leadership of yourself, and uh, they're better for it, and I, I'm thankful for that. So, uh, guys, we finished out. Dr. Taylor was our 17th teaching lesson. can't believe it's been 17 lessons, and uh, I hope you'll bear with us. We'll keep continuing on this every Monday night at 7, and uh, Dr. Taylor, we always invite all the, 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 the teachers to come back and and join us again. So, guys, uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to offer or say before we uh, leave for the evening? Hey, Dan. I yes, sir. Think same thing that you said about your kids. Uh, my PCA alumni are now 33 and almost 31. <laughs> and to hear them talk about their days there and the memories and what they learned. Um, my two son-in-laws are part of this Monday night group. So, to be able to talk to them and my daughters, it, it was great. And I think Dan also hit on it. 
you were just one of the guys, whether you're walking the sidelines of the football field, on the basketball court, or traveling with us in volleyball for all those state championships. We'd sit up there and, and all that. So thank you very, very much. Well, I think if you had to put up with uh, going to the swimming meets and uh, <laughs> having to watch some of that over the years, I'm, you, you know, I don't know if Billy Popoff, I know my son didn't swim, but I think there was a few swimmers. I don't know if Mr. Embry was a swimmer, but of course there was great, some great soccer games along the way. So anyway, uh, guys, have a great evening tonight. Thank you for joining us, and we'll look forward to coming together again next Monday. Have a great evening.